Greetings and welcome into the Patuxet General. I am your host, Jess. Today's poem is from our dear friend Jen at www.healinginsights.blog. Please check out her stuff. I love it. We couldn't be more proud of our fellow townie. Moon's Darling The moon greeted me this morning. The upper half was overhanging and slant in the blue sky. What does she balance on above that empty space? Pure magic, pure belief that she is held and so am I. There is no doubt, only trust. I too want to feel that blind leap of faith that an invisible net will catch me before the fall. The lure of an illusion of groundlessness is strong. And I, try as I might, to truly believe like the magic of seawater in a glass. The salt settles only if it is absolutely still. Then it can embody its true nature. There is only one way and that is to act. It is a mean trick that fear plays that I'll appear a fool, hurt myself or others, and to be that darling I know I am. There is only a door that is blocking out the light and the night. There is no view or glimpse of what beholds on the other side. I can grab a hold of the doorknob, pry it open as the hinges squeak and creak, adding to the mystery. Now all I have to do is step over the threshold of my mind and take that leap. To be Moon's darling in day and night. We dance as one in our exuberant embrace. There is no separation, no fear to interfere with this serene space. We'll hear more from her in the future. We have two recipes with mint this week to refresh you on these warm days and a mint julep to finish your hot day. But first, we would like to thank our Patreon subscribers. These festive people are the grilled hamburger and chips at the picnic table that is the Patuxet General. If you would like to join them at the table, the link is in the show notes. So thank you. Let's get to it. Our two recipes today are the vegan mint cucumber salad and a vegan mint cucumber smoothie. So admittedly, here in Patuxet this weekend, it's quite steamy for May. Just as we were enjoying the height of open window season. (sighs) Well, I was thinking it might be a good idea to break out some of those hydrating, delicious dishes we save for midsummer. I grow mint in my garden to discourage deer and wild bunnies from munching out, so I often have to weed it back into submission. I have an excess all season long. How about a few mint recipes? Between these two and the mint julep to follow, we've got you covered. There are versions of this salad all over the place, but this is my way. For this salad, you will need two large store-bought English cucumbers or four or five good-sized local pickling cucumbers, which is the tastiest way, but never used waxed cucumbers. You have no idea how old they are. But worse, you can't eat the skin, and so you miss out on all the vitamins just underneath that. And they taste funny. Yuck. One large red onion, peeled, top and bottom cut off, then sitting up, cut it in half. Put flat side down, then moderately thinly slice from top to bottom, which will give you rounded shards. Two tablespoons of oil of your choice, salt and pepper, a quarter of a cup of honey, the zest and juice of one lemon, a half a cup of cider vinegar, one good sized bunch of mint, stemmed and chopped, one good sized bunch of dill, stemmed and chopped. Into a good sized mixing bowl, add the honey, oil, vinegar, lemon zest and juice, salt and pepper. Give it a brisk and fabulous whisk, then add the onions to pickle a little. So, depending on what kind of cucumber you decide, you might choose to seed them if they are juicy, like an English cucumber, or not, like a pickling cucumber. Cut them into one inch pieces and toss those in as well. Stir in the finely chopped herbs and there you go. Very refreshing on a hot day and you won't get scurvy. This next recipe is so quick, almost no fuss or muss. For this smoothie, you will need 
ice, one seeded cucumber, two rounds of peeled ginger, one half inch thick, the juice of one lemon, the juice of two limes, one good sized sprig of mint, stemmed, a quarter of a cup of honey, and a large blender. Fill your blender halfway with ice. Throw in the ginger, cucumber, mint, honey, and juices. Blend. Pour into slushy appropriate glassware so that you can chill and enjoy. This next drink is so lovely and refreshing, it became the official drink of the Kentucky Derby in 1938. The beauty of this drink is that it is so chock full of ice that it is meant to very slowly be sipped as it melts. To sip it quickly kind of defeats the purpose, for it's really potent that way, not as tasty because water is part of the drink. Perfect on hot steamy days and simple to boot. Let's make mint juleps. For this recipe, you will need a silver or copper cup or an old-fashioned glass, one and one half teaspoons of superfine sugar, well-crushed ice, seltzer water, two and one half ounces whiskey of your choice. Rightio. First, you remove the leaves from the stems of the mint. Put them at the bottom of your glass with the sugar and muddle. Now, this is bartender talk for crushing the mint into the sugar. Add a splash of seltzer, then fill the glass three quarters filled with well-crushed ice. Then add the whiskey and top off with a mint sprig and another splash of seltzer. Try to slip slowly this week and enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. This week, we continue the reading of The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft, Chapter 4, Section 2. Not long after his mother's departure, Charles Ward began negotiating for the Patuxet bungalow. It was a squalid little wooden edifice with a concrete garage perched high on the sparsely settled bank of the river slightly above roads. For some odd reason, the youth would have nothing else. He gave the real estate agencies no peace till one of them secured it for him at an exorbitant price from a somewhat reluctant owner. And as soon as it was vacant, he took possession under cover of darkness, transporting in a great closed van the entire contents of his attic laboratory, including the books both weird and modern, which he had borrowed from his study. He had this van loaded in the black small hours, and his father recalls only a drowsy realization of stifled oaths and stamping feet on the night the goods were taken away. After that, Charles moved back to his old quarters on the third floor and never haunted the attic again. To the Patuxet bungalow, Charles transferred all the secrecy with which he had surrounded his attic realm, save that he now appeared to have two sharers in his mysteries, a villainous-looking man from the South Main Street waterfront and a thin, scholarly stranger with dark glasses and a stubbly full beard of dyed aspect whose status was evidently that of a colleague. Neighbors tried vainly to engage these odd persons in conversation. Gomes spoke very little English, and the bearded man, who gave his name as Dr. Allen, voluntarily followed his example. Ward himself tried to be more affable, but succeeded only in provoking curiosity with his rambling accounts of chemical research. Before long, queer tales began to circulate regarding the all-night burning of lights. And somewhat later, after this burning had suddenly ceased, there rose still queerer tales of disproportionate orders of meat from the butchers and the muffled shouting, no. declamations, well, rhythmic chanting and screaming no, supposed to come from very deep cellar below the place. And most distinctly, the new and strange household was bitterly disliked by the honest bourgeoisie of the vicinity. It was not remarkable that dark hints were advanced connecting the hated establishment with the current epidemic of vampiristic attacks and murders. 
especially since the radius of that plague seemed now confined wholly to Patuxet and the adjacent streets of Edgewood. Ward spent most of his time at the bungalow, but slept occasionally at home and was still reckoned a dweller beneath his father's roof. Twice he was absent from the city on week-long trips, whose destinations have not yet been discovered. He grew steadily paler and more emaciated even than before, and lacked some of his former assurance when repeating to Dr. Willette his old, old story of vital research and future revelations. Willette often waylaid him at his father's house, for the elder ward was deeply worried and perplexed, and wished his son to get as much sound oversight as could be managed in the case of so secretive and independent an adult. The doctor still insists that the youth was sane even as late as this, and adduces many a conversation to prove his point. About September, the vampirism declined, but the following January, Ward almost became involved in serious trouble. For some time, the nocturnal arrival and departure of motor trucks at the Patuxet bungalow had been commented upon. And at this juncture, an unforeseen hitch exposed the nature of at least one item of their contents. In a lonely spot near Hope Valley had occurred one of the frequent by waylaying of trucks by hijackers in quest of liquor shipments. But this time, the robbers had been destined to receive the greater shock. For the long cases they seized proved upon opening to contain some exceedingly gruesome things. So gruesome, in fact, that the matter could not be kept quiet amongst the denizens of the underworld. The thieves had hastily buried what they discovered, but when the state police got wind of the matter, a careful search was made. A recently arrested vagrant, under promise of immunity from prosecution on any additional charge, at last consented to guide a party of troopers to the spot, and there was found in that hasty cache a very hideous and shameful thing. It would not be well for the national or even the international sense of decorum if the public was ever to know what was uncovered by that awestruck party. There was no mistaking it, even by these far from studious officers. And telegrams to Washington ensued with feverish rapidity. The cases were addressed to Charles Ward at his Patuxet bungalow, and state and federal officials at once paid him a very forceful and serious call. They found him pallid and worried with his two odd companions, and received from him what seemed to be a valid explanation and evidence of innocence. He had needed certain anatomical specimens as part of a program of research whose depth and genuineness anyone who had known him in the last decade could prove, and had ordered the required kind and number from agencies, which he had thought as reasonably legitimate as such things could be. Of the identity of the specimens, he had known absolutely nothing, and was properly shocked when the inspectors hinted at the monstrous effect on public sentiment and national dignity which a knowledge of the matter would produce. In this statement, he was firmly sustained by his bearded colleague, Dr. Allen, whose oddly hollow voice carried even more conviction than his own nervous tones. So in the end, the officials took no action, but carefully set down the New York name and address which Ward gave them as a basis for a search which came to nothing. It is only fair to add that the specimens were quickly and quietly restored to their proper places and that the general public will never know of their blasphemous disturbance. On February 9th, 1928, Dr. Willette received a letter from Charles Ward, which he considers of extraordinary importance, and about which he has frequently quarreled with Dr. Lyman. Lyman believes that the note contains positive proof of a well-developed case of dementia precox. But Willette, on the other hand, regards it as the last perfectly sane utterance of the hapless youth. He calls a special attention to the normal character of the penmanship, which, though showing traces of shattered nerves, is nevertheless Ward's own. The text, in full, is as follows. 100 Prospect Street, Providence, Rhode Island, February 8th, 1928. Dear Dr. Willette, I feel at last the time has come for me to make disclosures which I have long promised you, and for which you have pressed me so often. 
The patience that you have shown in waiting and the confidence that you've shown in my mind and integrity are things I shall never cease to appreciate. And now that I'm ready to speak, I must own with some humiliation and no triumph, such as I have dreamed can never be mine. Instead of triumph, I have found terror. And my talk with you will not be a boast of victory, but a plea for help and advice in saving both myself and the world from a horror beyond all human conception or calculation. You recall those uh, Fenner letters said about the old raiding party at Patuxet? This must be done again, and quickly. Upon us depends more than can be put into words. All civilization, all natural law, perhaps even the fate of the solar system and the universe. I've brought to light a monstrous abnormality. But I did it for the sake of knowledge. Now for the sake of all life and nature, you must help me thrust it back into the dark again. I have left that Patuxet place forever, and we must extirpate everything existing there, alive or dead. I shall not go there again, and you must not believe it if you ever hear that I am there. I will tell you why I say this when I see you. I have come home for good, and wish that you would call on me the very first moment you can spare five or six hours continuously to hear what I have to say. It will take that long. And believe me when I tell you that you never had a more genuine professional duty than this. My life and reason are at the very least things which hang in the balance. I dare not tell my father, for he could not grasp the whole thing. But I have told him of my danger, and he has four men from the detective agency watching the house. I don't know how much good they can do. For they have against them forces which even you could not scarcely envision or acknowledge. So come quickly if you wish to see me alive. And hear how you can help to see the cosmos from a stark hell. Any time will do. I shall not go out of the house. Don't telephone ahead, for there is no telling who or what may try to intercept you. Let us pray to whatever gods that there may be. Nothing may prevent this meeting. In utmost gravity and desperation, Charles Dexter Ward. P.S. Shoot Dr. Allen on sight and dissolve his body in acid. Don't burn it. Dr. Willette received this note about 10.30 a.m. and immediately arranged to spare his whole late afternoon and evening for the momentous talk, letting it extend into the night as long as might be necessary. He planned to arrive about 4 o'clock and through all the intervening hours was so engulfed in every sort of wild speculation that most of his tasks were mechanically performed. Maniacal as the latter would have sounded to a stranger, Willette had seen too much of Charles Ward's oddities to dismiss it as sheer raving. That something very subtle, ancient, and horrible was hovering about, he felt quite sure. And the reference to Dr. Allen could almost be comprehended in view of what Patuxet Gossip said of Ward's enigmatical colleague. Willette had never seen the man, but had heard of his aspect and bearing, and could not but wonder what sort of eyes those much-discussed dark glasses might conceal. Promptly at four, Dr. Willette presented himself at the ward residence, but found to his annoyance that Charles had not adhered to his determination to remain indoors. The guards were there, but said that the young man seemed to have lost part of his timidity. He had that morning done much apparently frightened arguing and protesting over the telephone. One of the detectives said, replying to some unknown voice with phrases such as, I'm very tired and must rest a while. I can't receive anyone for some time. You'll have to excuse me. Please postpone decisive action until we can arrange some sort of compromise. I'm very sorry, but I must take a complete vacation from everything. I'll talk to you later. Then, apparently gaining boldness through meditation... He had slipped out so quietly that no one had heard him depart or knew that he had gone until he returned about one o'clock, entering the house without a word. He had gone upstairs, where a bit of his fear must have surged back, for he was heard to cry out in a highly terrified fashion upon entering his library, afterward trailing off into a kind of choking gasp. When, however, the butler had gone to inquire what the trouble was, he had appeared at the door with a great show of boldness and had silently gestured the man away in a manner that terrified him unaccountably. Then he had evidently done some rearranging of his shelves, for a great clattering and thumping and creaking ensued, after which he had reappeared and left at once. Willette inquired whether or not any message had been left, but was told there was none. 
The butler seemed queerly disturbed about something in Charles' appearance and manner, and asked solicitously if there was much hope for a cure of his disordered nerves. For almost two hours, Dr. Willette waited vainly in Charles Ward's library, watching the dusty shelves with their wide gaps, where books had been removed, and smiling grimly at the paneled overmantel on the north wall whence a year before the suave features of old Joseph Kerwin had looked mildly down. After a time, the shadows began to gather, and the sunset cheer gave place to a vague, growing terror, which flew shadow-like before the night. Mr. Ward finally arrived, and showed much surprise and anger at his son's absence after all the pains which had been taken to guard him. He had not known of Charles' appointment, and promised to notify Willette when the youth returned. In bidding the doctor goodbye, he expressed his utter perplexity at his son's condition, and urged the caller to do all he could to restore the boy to normal poise. Willette was glad to escape from that library, for something frightful and unholy seemed to haunt it, as if the vanished picture had left behind a legacy of evil. He had never liked that picture, and even now, strong-nerved as he was, there lurked a quality in its vacant panel which made him feel an urgent need to get out into the pure air as soon as possible. Thank you again for joining us here at the PG. We love having you here. And if you have a question, comment, or ghost story, or want to book us for an event, our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. But until then, we'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production. Pre-recorded in Patuxet. <laughs>